This is tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. It is the evening of State of the Nation. It's 25 years since Nelson Mandela walked out of Victor Verstappen prison and just a couple of weeks since Cape Town named a road after F.W. de Klerk. Somebody who has intersected South African history and Sub-Saharan African history for much of the last 40 years is Lord Robin Renwick. He's written a fabulous new book, his mission to South Africa, Diary of a Revolution. It goes back to the Lancaster House Agreement in then Rhodesia and then Robin Renwick became ambassador to South Africa. He's got fabulous insights into the characters of the time, into some of the deals that were done at the time, and he pulled it together in, in diary style. And it tells a remarkable tale for those mm -hmm. of us who are a little bit young to appreciate perhaps the full impact of what was going on behind the scenes, way back to the days of Rhodesia. Was that when you first became involved in African diplomacy? Yes, it was. And in Rhodesia, we, we decided that uh, when Margaret Thatcher became prime minister, we should try to do something different and really intervene, you know, take over, organize a, organize a ceasefire, organize an election, send some troops there to monitor the election and so on. And it was a, a risky, it was a risky thing to do, but she was a good risk taker. And, you know, with a bit of luck and some tight corners, uh, we, we, managed to, we managed to deliver a proper election result. Well, what strikes me about this tale of intervention in sub-Saharan African politics, or certainly into our regional politics, is the role that diplomats play. Um, we often sort of take for granted that the people who ride around in their D number plated cars, that's exactly what they get up to on a daily basis. Perhaps it's not quite as busy now as it was then, but you were instrumental in games of massively complicated chess. At times you were playing games of chess across 10 boards at a time. Well, I was here at a very fortunate time. You know, I started off in the days of P.W. Borta, so my meetings with P.W. Borta were extremely difficult, confrontational. They were all about because your 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 office mm. was in the parliamentary complex. It was across yes. the, almost across the corridor from his. Yes, he wanted to throw us out of the parliamentary <laughs> complex, but he didn't succeed at the time. Anyhow, it was about you know trying to save the lives of the Sharpeville Six. Uh, warning him against any further you know, attacks, bombing attacks on neighboring capitals and so on. So these were pretty difficult, you know, hostile uh, meetings. Because you didn't like him one little bit. I'm not sure who you dislike more, Mugabe or, or P.W. Well, you know, they're In diplomatic speak together. They are cut from exactly the same cloth. One happens to be black, one happens to be white, but they both believe in you know, murder as an acceptable political instrument. Uh, you know, this at the time, uh, there, were, there were thousands of people in detention without trial. The ANC leaders were either in jail or in exile. Um, there were death squads, you know, uh, the Civil Corporation Bureau and Mr. de Kock, who's just been released. Eugene de Kock, uh, yes. Yes, all of whom we were trying to help put out a business at the time. Uh, but we knew we couldn't really make any progress on Mandela and uh, negotiations with uh, P.W. Water, but we did make progress on, on Namibia, uh, uh, towards a Namibia settlement. And I have to say that Pick Bota, uh, who I saw in Johannesburg the other day, did play a very you know, big part in helping to deliver uh, peace in Namibia. Because as much as you dislike Mugabe and you dislike P.W. Water, mm. you, you want to pick Bota, garrulous, charming, adventurous, party-loving, not always truthful, Minister of Foreign Affairs. No, but you I, liked him. I liked him. I did. I, he, he, I always used to see him with a with a bottle of whiskey on the table between us, and he would look me straight in the eye and say, "Ambassador, I just want to assure you that there's not a single South African soldier anywhere in Angola." <laughs> Following which, we would both burst out laughing. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. He understood, but he understood the diplomatic game. He understood his role. He, yes, understood, he knew sure. what his job was. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you talk about your dealing with the verlichters of the time, the people who had um, a sense that apartheid was doomed, whether they yeah. uh, philosophically agreed with apartheid or not, they understood that it was doomed. Yes. And you were instrumental in discussions. Um, Anton Rupert uh, became a friend of yours. If they read Cloud became a friend of yours as well. He did. And also, you know, people like Professor Johann Haynes, head of the Reformed Church, and Peter de Lange, head of the Brodebond, they knew that things had to change. Uh, with FW, uh, my very first meeting with him, he said to me at the end of it, you were in Rhodesia, weren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I just want you to know, if I have my way, we won't make the same mistake the Rhodesians did. What and was I, the mistake, holding out too long? Exactly. And he, he, he said, leaving it much too late, to negotiate with the real black leaders. So from that moment on, I was really quite hopeful about what FW would do if and when he took over. 
I'd forgotten how close it was in the leadership battle for the National Party mm. between Bharat Duplessis, yes. the finance minister at the time, and F. Yes. W. de Klerk, who was minister of education. De Klerk got 69 votes, Duplessis got 60 or something. Yes. It was terrifyingly close, it because would the outcome have been different had Duplessis got the job? Uh, well, I th you know, du Duplessis got most of the Velikta votes, actually, and, and F. W. was still regarded as the very conservative leader of the National Party in the Transvaal. But I had had several meetings with him by then, so I was much more optimistic. I do think that um, we were fortunate because FW had the strength of character needed to see this through. You know, once he'd unbanned the ANC and even the South African Communist Party, you know, mayhem broke out. There was mm -hmm. a lot of turmoil and so on. And a lesser leader would have, you know, might have tried to stop halfway, which would have been disastrous or backtrack. Is contemporary um, South African South African history fair to F. W. De Klerk? No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, this fuss about having a road named after him. Of course, he should have a road named after him. So should Desmond Tutu. So should you know many of the ANC leaders. Walter Sisula I was, was a friend of mine. Uh, Oliver Tambo, uh, Ahmed Katrada, and so on. Um, and, and Mandela would have been mortified by that fuss about you know, a road being named after de Klerk. But you know, the older ANC leaders, uh, Katrada and uh, Halema Motlante, you know, both said this is nonsense, and of course it should happen. Without the strength of character that de Klerk exhibited at the time, and people forget just how insular and closed and how determined the securocrats of the time yeah. were to have a fight and to have a fight to the end. And they thought the end would be theirs, that they would have victory. They would simply lock up more dissidents yes. uh, and you know, build the walls even higher. It was an insane objective. De Klerk managed to see through it and managed to convince white South Africa yeah. that transformation and was it, in it, the best it, interest. It wasn't so easy. And uh, you know, there were the sections of the security forces that already long since had been engaged in all sorts of dirty tricks um, continued to be engaged in dirty tricks. And, and de Klerk tried to stop that. And we saw him trying to stop that, but he didn't uh, entirely succeed. I mean, it, uh, it was only when the Goldstone Commission finally exposed an awful lot of mm. what was going on uh, that he was able to curtail most of it. But still, even then, not all of it. When you look at the role of diplomacy in mm. these discussions, in these negotiations, and you look back at the role that you've played in shaping South Africa, you proud of that? Yes, I mean, um, you know, my Prime Minister Thatcher and I were determined. And then John Major afterwards as yeah, well. Yeah, were determined to encourage de Klerk. Mm. I and mean, we thought if de Klerk was going to do the right things, then we had to respond and show that we were going to be supportive and so on, even at a time when other countries weren't prepared to do that, you know, until there was one person, one vote. And the person who understood this better than anybody was Nelson Mandela. Mel Mandela understood very well that we were determined to maintain influence with the government. And I had many meetings with Mandela after he came out of jail. And the reason was he knew that we had influence with the government. So he wanted us to use that influence to help remove roadblocks in the negotiations. But the negotiations were between South Africans. What we were trying to do was just help both sides you know, get there. Mm. And one looks at Mugabe's response now to the moment anybody sort of says Britain, he goes apoplectic. Um, and the, the, the complete difference in South Africa's attitude towards Great Britain as part of the Commonwealth and Zimbabwe's role. Well, funnily enough, Mugabe was asked the other day about Britain, and he started singing the praises of the Conservative Party <laughs> and Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> much to my Hold surprise. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> However, maybe you know, the end is now. I think he's yes. just been terrible and a catastrophe for that country. But, um, you know, I, when, when I, Mandela was, was waiting, to, was getting ready to see Margaret Thatcher, you know, Mandela's whole technique. He, he's much wilier, much craftier, you know, much more sort of cunning he was than, than history gives him credit yes. for. You know, they, they pretend he was a sort of saint. And actually, he would uh, laugh at that. Uh, and his technique, as you know, was to disarm the opponent and, and co-opt him, starting with his warder, who became his chef and butler, then the justice minister, who kept asking me to help get him out of That's jail. That's Kirby Kutsia, right? Yeah, Kirby yeah. Kutsia. Then me, you know, you're my <laughs> advisor. You know, he would say in, in front of other people, this is my advisor, you know, uh, <laughs> the British ambassador. And the, um, his next target was Thatcher. And he, unlike the rest of the NC who wanted to fight with her, he, what he wanted to know was, how do I get her on my side? So we had a rehearsal for this meeting. I said, you can be Mandela, <laughs> I'll be Thatcher. And we, we had a, you know, he, he said he'd struggled for human rights all these years, you know, and so on and so forth. And I said, that's absolutely fine, Mr. Mandela. We'll support you on all of that. Now stop all this nonsense about nationalizing the banks and the mines. 
when he got to the meeting with Thatcher, I saw her just beforehand, and I said, you know, please remember... Here are your lines, He's yes. waited 27 <laughs> years to tell you his side of the story. And this got brought me a glare from the sort of clear mm -hmm. blue eyes. You mean I mustn't interrupt, she said. And I said, not for the first half hour, please. And she didn't. She let him talk for an hour, and she thawed visibly, you know. I mean, she was immensely impressed, as everybody would be, by this extremely dignified, magnanimous, courteous, old-world charm, personal charisma. You know. uh, so she... she uh, you won her over, too? Absolutely. absolutely. Mm. Let's fast forward. 2015, State of the Nation speech has happened. Let's ignore what mm. happened in Parliament. Based on your experience of nearly four decades of experience in our region, what's your take on the state of our nation February well, 2015? The first thing to say is that but for what de Klerk did when he did it, you were heading for complete disaster, mm -hmm. total international isolation, ever greater internal conflict. So whatever problems you have now, and you have serious problems now, yeah, pale in its um, yes. you know, they really are infinitely less grave than they were then. And what has happened uh, you know, over the 20 years since... since uh, uh, apartheid ended I and mean, new elections, 94 elections, there has been a lot of delivery of housing, electricity, drinkable water, there has been a huge expansion of the black middle class which is now bigger actually mm. than the white middle class in South Africa and a huge progress towards a genuinely multiracial society you know, which is very cheering for all of us who remember the days when people couldn't sit on park benches and yeah. go to beaches and so on. Um, the, the, there are really serious problems too, obviously. I mean, if, if the lights start going out, you know, it, it's, it's called load shedding, which is an Orwellian term, <laughs> Orwellian term for power cuts. You know, that is a very bad yes. sign in any economy because it imposes huge costs on the economy. It'll probably take 1% of GDP off your growth like that, this yes. year, and that's going to go on for the next two or three years. There's also confusion of policy. I mean, within the ruling party, I have many friends in the ruling party and friends in the DA and so on. But there is, uh, you know, one group are really quite attached to sort of free market principles. Another group are attached to ever greater state intervention. And I try to point out that in that case, this, you better have a very efficient state because if a bunch of East Germans couldn't, couldn't succeed in Germany, how do you expect to succeed by those means here? And that has caused confusion, for instance, over oil and gas exploration, which it has held back. It's causing confusion right now over investment in the mining industry. 7,000 people here in Cape Town, very few of them looking to invest in South Africa until we have clarity about the regulations and the legislation affecting mining. But we're blinkered to it. Is it, is it a leadership issue? I mean, what comes through so strongly is that mm. without the right leaders at the right time, and I'm reading Boris Johnson's book on Churchill at the moment, yeah. Churchill, a man in his time, perfectly suited to those conditions, without the right leader at the right time in the top job, do we have a chance? Well, of course, history is shaped, I mean, not just by historical forces, but by people. Witness what de Klerk did, witness what Mandela did. One reason I wrote this book was that the great lesson from Nelson Mandela was inclusiveness. He, f he was colorblind, he firmly believed, that this country could only succeed if all sections of the community were asked to make their contribution and did make their contribution. So, you know, one, everybody needs to get back to this idea of inclusiveness. For instance, if you want to succeed with land reform, you have to train and mentor the black farmers taking on the land. Mandela would be appealing to the white farming community to do just that. And funnily enough, would he, would have got a he would get a response. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. Lord Robin Renwick, thank you so much for coming in. Really nice to thank see you. Thank you very much. He's written a book, yeah. Commission to South Africa. You might think it's about what happened 25 and 30 years ago, but so much of it is about what is happening right now. Absolutely wonderful inside stories into the transformation of South Africa from apartheid to democracy and his views this evening on tonight's with Bruce Whitfield. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Bye-bye.